Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Buccieri, the Director of Publicity uh, at Copper Canyon Press. Uh, and you're watching our new interview series, Line Break, which goes off the page and into the homes and the minds of our beloved poets. Um, I've always had the dream of seeing more poets represented on screen, talking shop, answering questions, and kind of taking us behind the scenes of how they do what they do. Um, and working with these poets at the press has truly inspired me, it's challenged me, and it's been a ton of fun. So uh, in this series, I wanted to bring that spirit to you wherever you might be. Um, and each season, we will be bringing you episodes from different Copper Canyon Press poets. Um, and this episode, we are speaking with Jericho Brown. Um, Jericho, thank you so much for being here. How's your day going? It's a good day. It's a, it's good, a good day. day. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, well, instead of having me intro you, I'd love it if you could intro yourself, maybe, uh, maybe like name, pronouns, where you're, where you live, uh, most recent book you've published. Yeah, so my name is Jericho Brown. I'm, I'm shocked. A, I'm a poet. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my pronoun is he. Uh, I am. Um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, actually, I live in unincorporated DeKalb County. I live in the few mm -hmm. blocks between Atlanta, Georgia and Decatur, Georgia that are unincorporated and therefore I live in no city at all. <laughs> I, live, um, I, live, uh, I live in this house that makes me very happy because there's a window that I can look out of while I'm working because it's very big and all I see is my backyard, which is full of trees. And there's a similar window in the front of the house. And so I can work up there too. And I really just like to see the rabbits and the squirrels kind of take over. Uh, the poet Phil, Philip B. Williams, he used to be a poetry fellow where I teach at Emory University. And um, he came to my house one time and he said, why is your house like a Disney movie? Because there's all these, you know, you can see Blue Jays and Cardinals at my house all the time. And people are like, how is it that I see a Blue Jay at your house? <laughs> like Blue Jay? You know? So I'm very proud of that. Uh, I think I have a particular, particularly special relationship with animals. They're always around me and they just don't pay me very much attention. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I forgot I was introducing myself. Oh, but I'm- No, really, I love this. I'm originally from Louisiana. So, uh, All right. so I'm, you know, I, I always feel like, I always feel like when I say home conversationally, I'm talking about this house, but then there's a thing in me that says home and means Louisiana. So that's, that's where I'm from and this is where I live. And what else could I say to introduce myself? Oh, mm -hmm. I wrote, my last book was a book called The Tradition. Yeah. Whoop. Yeah. And I, I am really proud of that book. It makes, uh, it makes that book, the experience I had writing that book makes writing anything else very difficult. Because mm. I keep, because it's very difficult to forget that feeling. And I really just want to hold on to it. And I'm so I'm working right now to let that feeling go and to get into it. You know, every time you write a book, the, I mean, first of all, when you're a poet, you really just want to write. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And it's nice to make a book. But as soon as a book is done, for me, at least, maybe other poets feel differently. But when a book is done, you feel a little death happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that I have been missing for a for a while is um, I've been in mourning about the experience of writing the tradition because um, it really wore me out and I loved every second of it. Like it took everything. Uh, and I love that. I love that I felt like I was really giving my 100% body, mind and soul just to what I'd love to do the most, which is write poems. Um, so yeah, that's my last book. And I've written some, some poems since then that are okay. What else? Um, I think that is, you were happy about something. Uh, tell you if I'm what? You were you were you were saying, and I'm happy, and I and then I cut you off, and I was like, you were. Oh, I don't, rem I don't even remember. But let me tell you, I will tell you tell this. Tell me, because you mentioned it, because I emailed. Well, maybe I can't announce this. Actually, I can't. Oh yeah, I don't think you can. Oh, you'll have to cut it out. That's well, funny. I'll just say it this way. I'll say, yesterday. I was really down on myself about writing. Like I was really, yesterday I was, um, you know how you say these things and they're awful things and people shouldn't say them because they're not true. We have to be careful about 
what we tell ourselves. And often we say things that are just, I mean, I don't even know why we say these things, you know. Um, you know, I will say out of my mouth before a, a poetry reading, I will say, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna read. I don't have any poem. I have three books of poems. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. I'm getting ready to go somewhere. I don't know what I'm gonna wear. I don't have anything to wear. Closet full of clothes. I got I I three closets full of clothes. <laughs> oh you got three closets and little blue jays in your yeah, backyard yeah, like, helping exactly. you put on all these clothes. My God. And I was doing that about writing yesterday because um, you know, I want I want more to happen faster than it's ever happened before. Um, Is that because I, I, I should be used to this now, you know? Yeah. But I got this news that you would know about that I'm not supposed to tell anybody about. But when I got this little piece of news, I was like. I'm still in it. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm the, still a part. The fact that you could be sh shocked by that it just says it all. Like, I love that. I was, I actually, you know, Laura, it's so funny. And I know it, it's not going to make any sense to, to people, I guess. But whenever I get, whenever a good thing happens, I'm always like, really? Oh, wow. I'm a poet. <laughs> but that's so, like. That's so interesting because like, are you, did you ever have that kind of aha moment then where you were like, I'm a poet, like I'm doing this professionally, like this is my life. I didn't feel comfortable calling, I, I understood that I was a poet, but I didn't feel comfortable saying it until my first book came out. When wow. Please came out, like in 08, yeah. when Please came out, I was, I was convinced. I was like, oh, that's a book. I have proof. You know, and so when I'm telling myself I'm not a poet, I can hold up this book and be like, Jericho, you're a poet. Wow. Look. Um, and you, you know, that's tangible. That yeah, tangible yeah, thing, I yeah. something I could hold in my hand. I also think that, uh, I mean, what's interesting to me about all of that is, you know, that's always just been the goal. Like I just always just wanted to be a poet. And, and I like a day I like for a day to go by knowing that feeling, um, living and walking and being a poet. Mm -hmm. the, the, the bad thing about that is, um, and maybe the sad thing about that is, part of being, being a poet is having doubts about one's poetry. Absolutely. You know? And you can't get any better at it if you think it's over, if you think you're the best at it, <laughs> you're not gonna get any better. You know, there always has to be something that you're trying to figure out or uh, that I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Um, whether that's long lines or whether that's, uh, can I put abstractions at the end of a poem or whatever that is, there always has to be something you're trying to figure out. Hmm. That's, I, I find that really, well, I find that really interesting, but I want to back up and ask one thing. When did you start writing poetry, like in high school, in college, before that? What What are we talking here? Like little five year old Jericho running around writing a poem? Yeah, what I, age were you talking? I was writing poems as soon as I understood there were rhymes. Yeah. Uh, when I was very little, one of my earliest memories, as a matter of fact, is understanding that there were rhymes in songs. There's a song. Um, by Diana Ross called Upside Down. Mm -hmm. It occurred to me when I was a little kid and my mom and dad were playing the record on a record player. I'll never forget because I remember looking at it spin on the record player and listening to it and standing close because I wanted to hear the rhymes, right? And they were such exciting rhymes to me because they were giving me brand new words. You know, that song has words in it like instinctively respectfully. What did she rhyme instinctively with? Respectfully. Wow. <laughs> wow. Instinctively you give to me the love that I need. I cherish the moments with you. Respectfully I say to thee, I'm aware that you're cheating when no one makes me feel like you do. Bum, bum upside down so anyway <laughs> so anyway, you all these new words yeah yeah so when I figured that I was like oh my god instinctively respectfully and then, you know and then I would go around the house thinking of all these words now I couldn't do as long as instinctively or, or respectfully but I would be yeah. like jelly 
really? <laughs> and my mom and dad would get excited, you know, oh. which by the way is always the key. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when your parents get excited about something, then you're like, oh, this works. This, <laughs> oh, totally. more of this, you know. Well, um, you're, in, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're showing them something that they didn't know was in you or that they didn't understand was theirs. So. Yeah, they're still so confused by it too. You know, my mom, if I was sitting in a corner writing, I mean, and I could, when I was six years old, I was like this. If I was sitting in a corner writing something, my mom and dad would look on, look at me with such pride. You know, be like, oh, Trey is smart. Oh, he's sitting in that corner. He's writing. Now, I might have been writing awful things about them, but I was writing. And I remember, and, and so my parents are now like, How'd you, how did we do this? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> how is this our fate that you are a poet? And I'm like, you kept telling me I was smart. <laughs> you like that. When you I keep that yeah, you kept encouraging it. My yeah, God. Yeah. yeah. Do, so. do, have they read your books? I hope not. Yeah. I mean, they have, they've never said anything to me about, I think they read, my mom read some poems once and she was just so disappointed. Mm. Um, I was like, oh, you don't like them? She's like, I don't know why you would say that about your family. And I said, I said, mama, did I say something that wasn't true? <laughs> That's the problem though. <laughs> God. Oh, so she read a few poems when I was in grad school. I think I, I, I thought I had put everything away, but I think there were some poems out. Maybe that was Freudian, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, she, um, no, I, I don't, you know, I don't send them books when books come out or anything yeah. like that. Um, but there, and I think, I think that's what's best for us. You know, mm -hmm. I don't need them um, to write my poems. Uh, just like they don't need me to be in the middle of their lives. I don't take my mom and dad to work with me. I don't think anybody else does either. You know, and so, um, so I just think you get a lot more done at work. Mm -hmm. if you don't take your parents with you. Um, that, that is a good tagline. <laughs> unless you have like a family business, I guess. But <laughs> okay. all right, all right, all right. I, I, I just tell my family business. But this <laughs> I hear you. I, well, oh my god. Um, well, so I'm curious. Like you, so you mentioned songs. You mentioned you know learning rhymes and things like that from from music. But I'm curious. Like you know, when it comes to poetry, at least for me, I'd say that like everything can kind of be tracked to that first moment of like inspiration and that first moment that one kind of sees themselves represented in like a word, a phrase, a song, anything, a character. Um, so I'm curious, like, was it music that, that you kind of like, was the first time you saw yourself kind of represented in, in language or in kind of spirit? Or was it, were there shows or films or songs or poems that you connected with or identified with um, kind of initially? I actually think it was all of those things. I think it was really good for me to have been brought up in the Black church and to hear my pastor preach and to be aware of the fact that words made for emotions um, and that that was very open. So my pastor, the Reverend Harry Blake, would say things and people in the audience would react. And depending okay. on what he said, there would be a different reaction. And depending on how he said it, there would be a different reaction. Sometimes he could say the same thing three times in a row and that would get a reaction sometimes. And so there was always, and then, you know, there were the choirs, there was music, um, there were always plays, there were always things for me to see. and because of that, I understood that you could take these things that seem intangible mm -hmm. and make them tangible to the heart of a human being listening. Mm -hmm. uh, I understood that you could make these things that seem intangible and yet ignite the imagination of the person who was viewing them. And I knew I wanted to do that. I didn't understand that that meant being a poet. But I knew, I was amazed by it. Even as a kid, I was like, all these people are shouting and he just stood up and talked. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, I, I want to stand That's up. 
fantastic. Yeah. And that repetition that you mentioned, you're like, when, when, when he said something three times, it got a different reaction than saying it once or saying it quietly versus shouting it or say that, that, and that's so much in poetry that, and that, and it's not for me, at least so much in like fiction or memoir, things yeah. like that. Poetry really lends itself to, yeah. to that, in my opinion. Yeah. Music was really important. I mean, I, I, I come from a family, you know, if, if Gladys Knight was on TV, there would be like a shout through the house, Gladys Knight on TV. And then everybody would, in the house, it would be my grandmother's house or my house. Like it didn't matter whose house I was. I could be at my friend's house, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And would run to the TV to see what Gladys Knight was doing on TV. Mm. And she was singing. I was like, wow, all these people are just standing here to watch Gladys Knight sing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I'm interested, like, and why? Uh, because something about that wakes us up. Something about that reminds us that we are alive. Something about that allows us to feel whatever emotions we have and to be um, be um, be one hundred percent awake in the midst of those emotions. Uh, and that's what I think about art. That's what I think about poetry. Poetry asks us to be conscious of our emotions without running away. Right. Sure. Of the world asks us to be conscious of our emotion, to be unconscious of our emotions, right. or if we have a moment of consciousness, to put it aside. Sure. Right. Um, but poetry tells us, you know, <clears throat> we know this even before we start reading a poem. I mean, I, I sometimes feel bad for poetry because it's got like the heavy, it's like the lowest in terms of um, monetary capitalistic payoff. Absolutely. It's the heaviest burden. Because when, when somebody encounters a poem, mm -hmm. when they get to the first line, when they're reading the poem, they have an expectation. They want to know. You know, this is also why a lot of people, especially if a poem is somehow subtle, people are like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. What was I supposed to get? What did I miss? Because mm -hmm. there's a huge weight. Of, and it's so funny, you know, people watch dance. People look at abstract art. You know, and nobody <laughs> True, <freaks out>. actually. <laughs> I mean, like people, do you know what I'm saying? People watch all kinds or experience all kinds of art. Yeah. Not needing a one-to-one, -one, right? Yeah. But when it comes to poetry, people are like, <laughs> give me what I need. Where, how do I decode? How do I decode? Where, where is the, where is the manual? Yeah. Well, I have one more question for you. Actually, two, but one before this, one before two. <laughs> um, uh, uh, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, it's getting crazy over here. Um, so you won the Pulitzer. Everybody's asking you. I know everybody's asking you to do a lot because it comes to my inbox. Um, you know, and you, you're, <laughs> and you're saying yes to to so many things. You're being so generous with your time. But I'm curious, like how how do you how do you manage to hold on to space for yourself, for your writing, for your health, while you know being asked to do all of these these things that coincide with this just like huge huge prize or book or just moment? Like, is there is this like a conscious thing that you're like setting like one hour I can do this or two hours I can do this and that's all. Or is it just kind of, I don't know, I'm just really curious, how do you handle something like that? Yeah, I think, um, well, discipline is the answer. Yeah. Um, and saying no is a discipline, just like <laughs> time management, um, understanding that mm. I don't have to do everything that I'm asked to mm. do. Uh, I'm still probably doing too much, but I'm getting better. Um, yeah. I have no, I mean, <laughs> the wonderful thing is I have said more between May and December, January. I've said more between May and January than I have mm -hmm. in my whole life. Wow. I never said no before. I just didn't think it was an option. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure I would have what people think of as rec recognition if I were a person who had been willing to say no. Um, and I think up until winning the Pulitzer, I was much more a person who really would just work himself to death. Um, and I think I've gotten better 
because I have no choice. I think I've gotten better at not working myself to death. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the things I was talking about earlier when I said I missed writing the tradition. I was writing the tradition along with everything else that was expected of me. And I'm a person who's pretty big on um, responsibility and doing what I say I'm gonna do and trying to do it well, trying to do it the best I possibly can. So I think one of the things that I always had that the Pulitzer has asked me to really put in full effect is not just the discipline to say no, but the discipline to have a time for myself where I am um, in prayer and meditation uh, and affirmation, which I do daily. And something about that helps, something about doing that helps to organize everything else. It's just that when I do finally log into the emails, uh, which I appreciate you getting, <laughs> when I do finally get all the emails you send back to me, <laughs> when I finally do get those emails, I have a better idea of what's important and what's not. And just like mm -hmm. I'll try to end it at night. Like at night, I, um, I'll watch an episode of The Golden Girls, which seems oh. silly. But it's absolute, I find that if I watch an episode of the Golden Girls at night, then I can just go to bed and yeah. not hold on. Like I was doing this thing before where I would have a hard time falling asleep and I realized, oh, Jericho, you have a hard time falling asleep because you refuse to let go. You know, mm -hmm. and it's much easier to oh let go. Oh my God. You know, after I've watched um, Blanche and Dorothy sort of, you know, read each other, <laughs> and just be delighted only, you know, yeah. I can let go. I go, uh, I have some laughs. I think laughter is really important. I, I, I really think uh, mm. it's so interesting, you know, maybe everybody laughs at least once a day, but what would happen if we made our laughter more purposeful? And so what I decided to do at the onset of this, this pandemic is to plan my laughter. Um, and to wow. be purposeful about my laughter as I am about my writing or as I am about uh, my grading or meeting with students or anything else or, or um, even just being here with you, you know, anything else, I need to make sure that I have really guffawed, <laughs> that I have really just lost it before I get into bed at night because why have a day without, I mean, we could make a plan to, we know what makes each of us laugh. Uh, so we could make a plan to laugh every day. Uh, so that's part, I think, of, of what I've been doing. So, yeah. We, need, we all need to stop what we're doing and plan our laughs. I love that. I love that. I mean, like, I was, I was walking on the street the other day and I saw, uh, cause we're all wearing masks, right? These days, I saw this girl in her car uh, without a mask on, obviously, cause she's in her car. And she was like on the phone and she was cracking up laughing on the phone. And I realized I hadn't seen somebody laugh like in a really long time because we're all like wearing these masks and it just brought me, I don't know her or anything like that, but brought me such joy to like, pass by a car and see somebody totally cracking up and I so I believe in the power of laughter for sure it's it changes things you know yeah, it's beautiful to see and it's beautiful to feel yeah. Yeah. yeah well before we go will you maybe read us a poem either from one of your poems somebody else's poem uh and maybe uh, give yeah go ahead my favorite poet lately uh, has been a poet named Yesenia Montilla. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll read a new poem by her. Um, it's a poem called A Brief Meditation on Breath. I have driver's lungs from holding my breath for so long. I promise you I am not trying to break a record. Sometimes I just forget to exhale. My shoulders held tightly near my neck. I am a ball of tense living a tumbleweed with steel-toed boots. I can't remember the last time I felt light as a dandelion. I can't remember the last time I took the sweetness in and my diaphragm expanded into song. They tell me breathing is everything, meaning if I breathe right, I can live to be ancient. I'll grow a soft furry tail 
or be telekinetic, something powerful enough to heal the world. I swear I thought the last time I'd think of death with breath was that balmy day in July when the cops became a raging fire and sucked the breath out of Garner. But yesterday, I walked 38 blocks to my father's house with a mask over my nose and mouth, the sweat dripping off my chin, only to get caught in fabric and pulled up like rain. And I inhaled small spurts of me, little particles of my DNA. I took into my body my own self and thought I'd die from so much exposure to my own bereavement. They're saying this virus takes your breath away, not like a mother's love or like a good kiss from your lover's soft mouth, but like the police, it can kill you fast or slow. Dealer's choice, a pallbearer carrying your body without a casket. They say it's so contagious, it could be quite breathtaking, so persistent, it might as well be breathing down your neck. Isn't that good? Oh my God. I think yeah. she's really, really great at doing, so, I mean, I think she's always been really good, but doing some really fantabulous work in these poems that I've been seeing come up over the very last few years. So I'm really um, excited for her and um, completely jealous. And uh, I think people should um, should look that poem up and look up, look up other of her work and buy her books. She's great. I agree. Um, I love that poem and thank you for reading it. I love, I love hearing that out loud. The, the repetition of breath, just, it, it's a lot. Um, well, thank you, Jericho. I really, I appreciate you taking the time and being here and just being such a great guest. Um, and thank you everybody at home for watching and we will see you next time.